Life is all about relationships. Lovers, family, body, or money. How satisfied you are can be completely explained by how you relate to things around you. This is Sophie Jaffe, and together with my husband, Dr. D. Jaffe, we are here to explore and teach you how to maximize your relationships and achieve a happier life. Let's get ignited. This episode of the Ignited Podcast is brought to you by Philosophy Superfoods. The Philosophy offers cleanses and other nutritional products that are unlike any of the other supplements and detoxification programs on the market. Why? Because they actually nourish the body with whole, live, nutrient-rich foods instead of depriving you and leaving you hungry. Have you ever tried a cleanse only to find out that you can't make it through a whole day because you're starving? Ever try a superfood shake that made you nauseous because it was so disgusting you'd rather not eat? The Philosophy Fix All That with a simple set of offerings that load up your body with nutrients while actually tasting good. Makes sense, right? Each of the Philosophy Superfood and Protein Blends is vegan, raw, gluten-free, and has absolutely no filler ingredients. With over 15,000 satisfied customers, including some of the world's biggest celebrities like George Clooney, Gerard Butler, Leah Michelle, and over 10 years of experience, this is the best stuff you can get. To buy some or find out more info, go to our website, thephilosophy.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Ignited Podcast. I'm Adi Jaffe. And I'm Sophie Jaffe. And we're bringing you a, would you say this is a an often requested topic? Yeah, I'd say weekly. I am asked via email, DM, friends, phone calls, text messages, how do you repair a broken relationship and or how do I renew my trust, the trust in our relationship? Like, how do you trust again? How do you get to that place? I think that's the most common question, right? How do you get to trust again? Yeah. You've been broken. You've been betrayed. You've been lied to. You've been cheated on. Whatever it is, it's, betrayal is all looks different, <laughs> sounds different. We explain it differently, but betrayal is betrayal. And once you feel like your trust has been broken, how do you get back to a place of not just healthy again, but thriving? And in this episode, we have three easy tips to restore all your trust in one week. In nine minutes or less. Yeah. Oh, nine minutes? You know. That's awesome. Why not? Well, it's like I'm better than 10. It is better. Yeah. It's definitely better than a week. Great. Um, I pick nine minutes over the less than a week, personally. Okay. I'm I'm down. I'm down. Um, So, yeah. I mean, basically, this is a question because of a D&I's previous Going Deep episodes, which you have to listen to before you jump into this one, I would say. Just so you know our story, you know where we are coming from personally. And that episode is, one of the episodes is literally called Our Story. So, that should be pretty easy to find. And then there's a follow-up to that. So, I would... Listen to those first and then come back to this episode. But for those of you that have followed along, are right here with us, have listened to those episodes, know where we're at, and still wondering how in the world could you have rebuilt trust? Like, there, you can't possibly really trust a D again. And it blows my own mind because 10 years ago, after what we went through, I definitely would have said there's not a chance. You did say there was not a chance. I said there was not a chance. <laughs> I mean, you were literally, I mean, I think just so people understand the the point of reference. Like at the time you were staying with me pretty much because you were pregnant. Yeah. I think I also used it kind of as an excuse. Like when I, because I was pregnant and I really wanted to still be with you, I think it was a way to like blame it on something so that I could still stay with you because okay. I didn't I didn't want to abandon the relationship. I believed in you. I believed in us. But then you fucked up again. So I was like, wow, we're doing this again. Great. Here we go again. And it felt so familiar. And it felt like I like what an idiot. Like, how could I have let this happen again? But it's, you know, there take it takes two for everything. I don't take I don't blame 100% on a D for the things that happened. 
and I don't take full responsibility either. It's 50 50 to showing up to a relationship. But that's even that's different now than it was then. Like, yeah. When that happened, just it was, so it's clear, because I, I just want to clarify for people when they ask about the trust, there's been a lot of work to get here. Number one, that was a joke about the nine minutes or one week for those of you who didn't get it earlier. Um, but also in that lots of work, there have been shifts and growths over the last, I guess it's nine years to 10 years that have shifted even your perspective and my perspective literally about what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, at the time, we did look at it as 100% my fuck up. I mean, even right. I looked at it as 100% my fuck yeah, up. I'm not saying was, you looked at it that sure. way. I did too. And a lot of the reasons that you were betraying and why you were lying and hiding were your own things for sure that you brought into the relationship. But I attracted you in my life. There are certain lessons that I needed to learn for whatever reason karma, past lives, past relationships, family of origin, what have you. I attracted this into my life for a reason. I needed to go through this growing potential, this pathway, this passage, and these hard lessons and get through to the other side. And I'm lucky to have had a partner that was willing to work That's the number one thing in terms of healing is that you have to have a partner willing to work with you for the relationship and for themselves as an individual. Yeah, I had a message yesterday from somebody on Instagram who was talking about kind of presenting her, you know, we get these a few, I only get them a few times a week, you probably get them daily. But she kind of said how inspiring our story was and, and how she's going through something right now in her relationship and it's really been able to help her ground because of listening to our story. And then she started describing what's going on. And I was, you know, I was asking questions and and being interested. And she started describing that every time she has a conversation with her partner, they're not married or anything, they're dating. But every time that she has a conversation with him that he checks out, like he's looking at his phone and he's saying, yeah, I'm listening or, you know, when, uh, was it the audio book or no, the podcast, she had him listen to our story and he's like on his phone the whole time while supposedly listening to the podcast. And I said, you know, look, you can do all the work in the world, but if your partner's not engaged, nothing is going to change. Yeah. What's the expression? You can, you can bring a, bring a horse, a horse to, to water. water, but you can't make a drink. Yeah. You can't make him listen. Like you yeah. can't force him to hear it. Yep. He can listen. He can sit and listen on loop to our podcast. He can sit in a therapist's office and sit there and show up, but he can be a dick the whole time and close his ears and decide he doesn't want to, or just completely turn off. It's up to, it's up to the individual partner to show up and do the work. And I think the first time around you weren't willing to do the work and that's why you didn't fully heal. You were kind of like showing up, Going to meetings, but not really being like, I'm part of this world. I'm an addict. Well, I mean, again, obviously, you know this about me. I don't even know that I would describe it that way, really. Um, I learned a lot about intimacy issues I had and shame and all that stuff as we did our work. Which is probably 90% of why the things happen, right? Like you always say, shame is actually... A bigger issue than the issue itself. Oh, all the time. I mean, I didn't know and the possibility of coming to you and speaking to you about the things that I was feeling bad about or dissatisfied about or whatever. It literally didn't even cross my mind because all I wanted to do was hide it from you. Yeah. Part of what I'm saying in this is, you know, when I went to SA, when I was going to sex addiction yeah, meetings. Yeah, just so you know, for those of you that are like, what the heck? And I didn't listen to the other Going Deep episode. We went through a series of sex addiction-like episodes um a d was an ex drug addict like we had some serious like lines of addiction going on and relapse and deceit and lies and manipulation and that's what we're referring to yeah yeah and again just pause on this go to the other episode and listen because none of this will or this won't land as deeply if you don't really understand where we're coming from Mm -hmm. so i did what i knew was available Because there really wasn't much more available. We went to the place that did sex addiction treatment. We went to the sex addiction meetings. When I look at it, 
honestly, a lot of my intimacy and sex addiction stuff is probably part of what drove the drug addiction stuff anyway. Sure, an escape. Because the shame underlying that is I'm not good enough. Um, women don't like me, as you know now, and I've no, I have a lot less shame about saying this than I've said this to a lot of other people. Like wondering about my own sexual orientation. Repeat. Like there was so much confusion and shame that I was hiding constantly or trying to band aid that I didn't even know it. And before meth. First of all, a great drug to have sex on. Secondly, a great drug to block feelings. Thirdly, you hang out with a lot of girls who do meth, you get laid. And it was like all that stuff just worked together. Now, when we were dealing with our issues, I just did the thing that I knew was available. But I'll be honest, it's still a very limited, not to me, not a very deep exploration of what was really going on for me. So that was a good start. Sure. And even showing up and going to the meetings, it's as much as you make it be. Yep. Uh, getting up and going to see a therapist, if your therapist doesn't challenge you and push the envelope and you just show up and they want to get paid, so they're like agreeing with you the whole time, that's your responsibility to challenge that, challenge yourself and be like, eh, this person's actually not pushing me to my edge. Therefore, I'm not getting the most out of this experience. Therefore, I'm not going to grow and I'm not going to change. And that's the whole point of life is growing. You're yeah. always growing and changing and shifting. So I was going to those meetings for like eight months. Sure. Almost you were going a, through the motions. Almost on a daily basis. Sure. All I'm, the reason I'm saying it like this is it didn't feel like I was going through the motions. At the I, time. I need to be clear. Like I felt like I was doing work, but there were things that were still too hidden, things that I wasn't willing to share, things... It wasn't like when I was going to the meeting, I was outright lying. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that I think is important for people to understand. Like, You as, thought that you were going I there. I thought I was doing the work. And yeah. when the layers reveal themselves, there's oftentimes more shit to reveal. Honestly, we still have stuff we're working through. It's just of that course, we have forever. More, it's just that we have more tools now so that the working through stuff is not this explosive craziness like it used to be. But we're working through stuff all the time. So... I was going and then like the other shoe dropped because there was this whole area that I, that I hadn't shared. And I think that's important for people to understand. Cause I, you know, cheated on you once when we were dating, then there was the texting stuff that you revealed. And after that is when I started going to meetings. And then when the other shoe dropped, we realized, I realized there was even much, much deeper things, things that came long before you. Right. I mean, the whole point is that, that online sex stuff, the online chatting and all that, that had been going on four or five years before I met you. And if I think about all the way to like watching porn and all that stuff since I was 13. Mm -hmm. So the layers, layers of shame were really deep and the experience had been there for a long time. The question is for you, this third time now realizing, oh my God, I just got lied to again. What was the road to... How do I regain trust? How do I get back to saying, again, let's get on the horse and, and do whatever is required to trust? Yeah, I mean, I think personally for me, I realized at that final shoe dropping that it wasn't your problem only and that I had to confront what my part was in the whole thing. So am I codependent? I don't know. Let's define that. Let's look at books. Let's read them. Let's go to codependency meetings. Let's, what is it about me that's attracting an addict? And what is it about me that's allowing this behavior in my life? And how can I shift and change and show up differently to this relationship? Um, also like, oh, cool. We're seeing a couples therapist. You're seeing a therapist for X, Y, and Z. But what about me? Like, don't I need to see someone? So all of these like I started to take some ownership of my own healing and keeping my side of the seat street clean and doing the work for me. And that's what allowed me to show up differently to us. Were the couples meetings the place where you first realized that or did you realize it before? No, I think before that I was seeing someone, my own therapist, and then the couples meetings came. Um, I think pretty early on in figuring out like A, I was early on pregnant and B, I was early on finding out about our stuff. And I feel like that's when I realized it's time for me to, to take some ownership. So just know that whatever it is, you're in this partnership together and both people need to 
connect and do the work and be open to self-growth and healing and self-improvement in whatever capacity. So maybe there's some like wound from childhood that you need to face. Maybe there's like, you need to have some stronger boundaries in your life. Like there is no one answer to this. For me, it was getting in there and doing the work and figuring out where the gaps were and holes were in my own healing and my own processing and what it was that attracted this kind of behavior again and again in mm-hmm. different forms. Um, so first first and foremost, the first thing is getting doing the work yourself. Yeah. And we just talked to a friend this morning, a very close friend who's going through her husband, I mean, her fiance, all of a sudden they're realizing that she ha- he has a drinking problem. And he doesn't drink heavily. He's not like a psycho drinker, like like throwing back vodka fifths in the closet. It's not like that. It's just regular drinking that he's hiding. And I don't know that for a fact. Yes, you just looked me to face. Like <laughs> I don't know that he's not drinking super, super heavily. Her point was not about the quantity. It was about the hiding. Right, but even the hiding comes around because of judgment around the old patterns of drinking. So it's like the hiding doesn't happen just because the hiding happens because at some point there's a conversation like, Hey, you're drinking really heavily or often or often. And the person goes, Oh yeah. And they don't have any additional tools. There's no, there's no resources that come along with that conversation. It's just, you should drink less. Right. But whatever it is that they're struggling with. I mean, I talked so about this a lot. So then he started to hide it. So there's hiding. And I don't know if he started it then. It could be that a conversation like that happened earlier in life. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's how people learn to hide their yeah. behavior. But it's funny because our thing, quote unquote, was sex addiction. Your thing before was, quote unquote, drug addiction. And her thing with him is alcohol. But it all is showing up the same way. The same advice I gave her is the same advice that I would give anyone. It's show, you do your own work. Always. And well, you do your own work. And I I think it's important that you say this as a partner because we live in a world where it's like, that motherfucker cheated. Fuck him. Once a cheater, always a cheater. Leave him because he's a piece of shit. Right. I mean, look, also, I got to admit that could be true. Yeah. But I just have to say, if it is, what then do we do? Like, let's say that only exists in 5 to 10, 10% of men. Mm-hmm. And let's say it's only men. It's not. But it, it, women also cheat and women also lie and all that kind of stuff. But let's say it's only men. Yeah. So if that is true, then is what we're saying literally that there's like 5 to 10% of men who should can never be in a relationship because they're always cheaters, always liars, will never be able to get better? Right. I think that's bullshit. I think... That's the shorthand version of we don't want to do the work to figure out why the lying is happening. Right. People don't want to fucking lie. Like, yes, they're sociopathic. Like, um, let's assume that your partner is not a sociopath. Let's just hope that he's not or she's not. And just think like, oh, there might be a deeper seated issue here that needs to be faced. And what I told my girlfriend this morning is, look, you can walk away right now. You're lucky enough that. that you don't have children. You're lucky enough that you aren't married yet. What a gift you've been given to go through this right now as a precursor to getting married right now. Like yeah. you could, even if you had married, you were married and you had kids, you could still leave. I can leave at any moment. Anyone can leave their marriage at any moment. You are a free individual. However, it's a lot easier when you don't have those strings. All you have is a dog. All you have is a ring on your finger. Like yep. no problem. So knowing that you're a free person, and you can do whatever you want to do at any moment and leave whenever you want to. What is it that's showing up for you? Because your dad used to drink. And you, this is very triggering for you. Did you bury a lot of that stuff? And now it's facing you again? If so, time to face it now. Or else it's just going to rear its ugly head 15 years down the line when you have two children. Well, if you talk to Lacey and Daryl, I don't know if that'll air before this or after this, but in... It's the third or fourth one with them. So I don't know if that's the, you'll hear this yet. But the point is, um, Lacey was talking about really wanting to feel safe and not trusting Daryl. Yeah. And yes, part of that is because of the cheating that happened seven months ago. But she also shared that a lot of mistrust happened with her ex-husband. Mm-hmm. And so the, right. so the solution from the moment she started actually seriously dating Daryl was we never go out alone. We always go out together. Yeah. And I was pointing out 
you know, you've heard the phrase, I only trust him as far as I can throw him. Right. Well, that's not very fucking far. So if that's what happens to you. Yeah. And you don't develop tools and ways to trust the person more. Exactly. That's not a good way to overcome your insecurity is to always be on their ass. Like that creates a terrible relationship, right? Ugh. Because, I know that so well. Because from that point on, you always have to be looking. Yeah. And you, it's almost like you accept, I will always look, which puts stress on you and puts resentment on the relationship. Our whole goal, and I think, I don't know that we would have stayed together if we couldn't achieve this. Um, I, I have no idea. But our goal was to get to a place where we cross that bridge and you could say, I feel okay again. Not to say, I, I know Adi hasn't fucked up, but, right. but I've got the reins on him and well, I'm watching I, everything. It's like... I don't want to live in a relationship or reality where I'm like, cool, a D doesn't cheat on me anymore. Right. But that doesn't mean that we have a healthy sex life. That doesn't mean that we have a healthy, fun, like nightlife, date night, intimacy, friendship. Like I don't, I want to have it all and we can and we do. And I think that's the most beautiful part. Like when, when my friend first called today, she was like, how do I rebuild trust? And I was like, honey, this just happened. Read the book that you bought on codependency. That's great, great place to start. But don't even worry about that right now. Just be in this. Allow him to go to meetings or whatever it is that's feeling right to him in this moment. Start to dig in. You just do the work from your side. You keep your side of the street clean. And then you'll get into all that. You're seeing a therapist in two weeks together. Like, Don't worry about repairing it yet. Just be in it. Yeah. It's like getting a cut and going like, but when when is the scar not going to be there anymore? Right. Like, hold up. Yep. Just put some fucking Neosporin on it and put like, get it, get a healing. Exactly. And we'll talk about the rest later. You know, exactly. it's like, yeah, I think that's right. I think people, well, people I think are scared that they're never going to get there. And they kind of ask themselves, should I even put the Neosporin on or yeah. should I just go away? I mean, and so what we left the conversation with is if he's willing to do the work, if he's willing to find a good therapist for himself, find a good couples therapist for the two of you, he's willing to go to some sort of like a meeting, whether it be a smart recovery meeting or an AA meeting. If he's willing to read a few books, listen to a few podcasts dig in and have these conversations with you and hold space for you in your healing because this triggers a lot from you from childhood. You're on a good path and just know that there is hope on the other side and that my trust with you is 99.9% .9 there, which I think is healthy because I've been in the situation several times in my past where I say 100% of something, 100% of something out. And like things just surprise you. People are human. We make mistakes. Like you shouldn't put 100% of trust in me because I'm human. 100% like we've learned from this. Like if you go back to one of our past episodes where we talk about where I cheated on a D, our girlfriend, one of my best friends was there that night and she had 100% had me on a pedestal, 100%. And that made me feel like I had nowhere to go but down. And then when I mm. crashed, I crashed hard. I shouldn't have 100% trust in you. Like, you are a human being that ha is capable of hurting me again, just as I could hurt you at any moment. But 99% of the time, I feel really good about re our relationship. Sometimes I feel jealousy. You know what? Sometimes that serves me. It's a survival mechanism. But that's just real. That's just honest. That's not because of the past pain. Yeah. And I think it's... I think it was actually funny. Last night we were watching that show. I want to get in this to the tools and the system that you work through because I think that'll be really important for people. Yeah. But we were watching the show Wonderlust. Mm -hmm. Wonderlust. The Tony Collette and like it's about this British couple who tries an open relationship. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to watch because first of all, the I was thinking to myself, there's 0% chance. Not not. 0.001% chance. We would have even be able to like turn that thing on. Right. Or talk about the potential of watching that thing. You would have, you would have like punched me if that would have even come up back then. But now we're watching it. It's, it's interesting. And so I think that's the reason I'm saying that is the growth, the growth, but also don't, don't think that where you are right now is where you're going to be in a year or two years or three years and, and stop saying to yourself because so many people say well i'm not there i'm not where i want to end up the timeline thing is really a place that's going to hurt you if you start being like 
I can't believe we're not X any yet. I can't believe we're not at this place of trust yet because that's, I definitely like shot myself in the foot several times by being like, oh, I trust you again. And we'd be in therapy and I'd be like convincing our therapist. No, I'm good. I do trust them. I do. I do. No, I do. And I wasn't ready for yeah. whatever it was. And and then that would blow up because. I was trying to force it. And the idea of, oh, I trust him at another level now is now we can let something else into our world that wasn't allowed before because you trust me more. That yeah. was kind of, so I think one of the like big things for me is the biggest thing is be open to self-growth and improvement. Um, you can't repair trust, like broken trust with just promises and statements of forgiveness. So someone can say a lot of things, right? I will do this. I want to do this. I want to be this kind of man. I want to be this type of wife. I want to be this kind of partner. It's the actions. So be aware, be conscious, watch yourself, watch your partner. And if you're both showing up and doing the work, that's the first step towards rebuilding trust. I, th I think in the context of our stories, because people ask this specific question, like, how do I know? And we talked about it. Oh, yeah. A lot of times. How did you know that he was even worthy of staying and sticking around? And when we, ha we had another friend who was struggling with this kind of thing, and it's been a lot of argument and fights about whether her partner is really showing up. I I see it. I don't know how you see it. And I, I'd actually like to hear about it. Um, I see part of the difference in that every time we figured out something was wrong, we worked harder. Like we put more in. Right. And then at some point we hit this mark where things stopped getting harder mm -hmm. and they started getting easier. And that's like, right. That's when you know that like you're on the right path. So it's like, Oh, I fucked up. You broke up with me. Right. Oh, I fucked up. I'm going to get some help. Oh, yeah. that help was not enough. We got more help. Yeah. And Adi's talking about this friend that kept going back to an, a relationship that wasn't serving her and they weren't, it wasn't serving the greater good and definitely wasn't who they're supposed to be with each other. And she keeps going back and he keeps going back to her, but there's never been any like, okay, we're past this point and now it gets easier. The lies just keep happening. The deceit, the manipulation, the hiding. Yeah. It's just the same cycle over and over again. If it's not getting better and you keep showing up and expecting different results, that's on you. Take yeah. responsibility. So I think when you show, is the action happening? You know, look, if you tried some tools and they're not working, that happens. Yeah. But you better put some new fucking tools in place and yeah. you better try harder and you better work at it and that's okay. Yeah. Um, the next thing is kind of about deciding to forgive. I think this is a big one. Mm -hmm. So deciding to be forgiven or deciding to forgive. So I feel like a lot of times we expect just to be forgiven or we expect that you should just forgive me in this situation because I'm your partner and because, you know, because of love. But it, it's a lot more than that. To actually forgive and let go of the past is huge. And first of all, to, to be graceful with yourself and compassionate and gentle and know that that takes a lot. But the actual act of forgiving and to give yourself that respect and the partnership that respect to Maybe you give yourself a forgiveness prayer every single day, or maybe you say, I forgive you five times a day when you wake up, five times a day before you go to sleep to your partner, and just think to yourself, I want to forgive this person, and I do. And then by stepping into that relationship and stepping into that intention, there's a better chance of forgiving because you've set that space. So again... So setting that intention of forgiving someone else or forgiving yourself is huge. Just that intention can shift the energy big time. It doesn't mean that you've forgiven the person. It doesn't mean you've forgiven yourself. It just means that you are in a space where you're open to that possibility. So there's this um, Hawaiian prayer for forgiveness and it's, I love you, thank you, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And it's something that you can repeat three times a day. It's something you can repeat when you're feeling stuck. You can say it towards yourself. And I did this a lot around my mom um, in the years that I was really angry with her. And it helped a lot. It helped kind of like close that door. So that's the second, my second kind of big tip is about forgiveness. Is and there a feeling associated with letting go? Like, 
as that forgiveness, because it sounds like it was a process more than a, a thing you crossed over. Absolutely. What did that, how did that feel differently in our interactions by yourself when you woke up? Like, how did you know that it was progressing? I think just a lightness, like it just became lighter. I wasn't so heavy all the time because it's actually like really intense and hard to carry around that weight the resentment. of being angry. Mm. Like it's not fun to be resentful. It's not fun to be angry. So be getting into the headspace of like, I'm on my way. I'm on the path to forgiveness was really helpful. Cool. Um, yeah. And so like, I think along with, that's like an intention, right? So being clear about your intentions from the very beginning is really important. What do you mean? On both sides. Oh, your intention like for the relationship? For the literally? relationship. Like, are you guys even on the same page? Yeah. Like, that's really important. And then I think for both of us, one of the biggest things, and then we'll kind of close this out, is the leaning in. So if you want to explain this, the the coming in for the hug, I think this is one of the biggest concepts that helped us heal. Yeah, I mean, we look, we've talked about this before. Um, I'm trying to think of kind of how to explain it in the, from the perspective, the context of what we're talking about right now. Well, you know, maybe I'll tell it this way. One of the women in our couples group talks about it this way. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think maybe to not talk about it exactly the way I've talked about it before in our own experiences would be, would be useful. So when we first came in, there were, there's always other couples in this group and they're, they're struggling, like they're having severe pain. And this one couple in particular, they were fighting. I mean, the woman wanted to stab the husband in the eye, like and kill him and said things similar to that multiple times. But they had been married for decades and the cheating was long standing. I mean, that was it was a severe pain there, right? He was a, he was a musician and just I yeah. mean, traveled on the road for years and years and decades being the center of attention and having fangirls and all that. Yeah. And it was like, it was intense. It was intense. Dozens so, of betrayals. So deep wounds. You know, the wife is calling him out all the time. And I mean, there was some progress, but it wasn't looking good. Right. I mean, it literally, I, I didn't know if one day we were going to get a call that like she stabbed him or like punched him out and they're in the hospital and they're not coming back anymore. And she did a lot of work. He did a lot of work the whole time. And then things shifted. And later, because we were doing our own work, so I don't know that I was focused on what exactly shifted in them, but later she started identifying the main shift she felt in allowing her to temper her anger and start feeling a little bit safer in the relationship around the fact that at some point, he stopped resisting. He stopped trying to defend himself. And look, I mean, anybody who's listening to this right now, like if there's a husband or a boyfriend or just a guy listening who's been through this yourself, either because you've been cheated on or you were the one who did the cheating or you've been in those kinds of struggles, it's hard when somebody's coming at you and calling you out on your shit and saying, you're a fucking asshole. I trusted you. You know, you're You've lied to me to my face dozens of times. You're I think a piece even, of shit. I think holding space for someone it has a whole new meaning after what we've been through. Like the ability to hold space. Like I've only learned this concept in the last few years. The ability to just hold space for someone is so healing. Yeah. And when you feel like you're the target of the aggression, that's really hard. Yeah. And so one of the biggest lessons was to not feel like you have to defend yourself when somebody is mad at you. Right. Because we feel like I either have to attack you or I have to defend. Yep. And what she was saying is when her husband stopped trying to defend himself yeah. and literally just learned to say, Surrender. I'm so sorry. I'm yeah. so sorry you feel that way. I'm Surrender. so sorry I did things that made you feel that way. Yeah. Without feeling like he had to give an excuse or a reason as to why it happened, it allowed her to process her own emotions. It's also just such a turnoff when, you're, when someone hurts you you go in and be like, hey, I'm being vulnerable. You you really hurt me. Not even like you're a fucking asshole, which she was. Even just like bring it up. Like we're hanging out, having dinner, and it's three weeks after discovery, three months after discovery, a year after. And I'm like, Adi, you know, like I, I'm pissed today. Like I, it sucks that you cheated on me. I don't, I don't know you, that it, You could come in. Oh, totally. I, you I, could come in I, I and be like. To defend. Why are you bringing that up right now? We're having, we're having lunch. We were, we're having, having a, a good day. Yeah. What the fuck? Why would you ruin today? There's like two different ways to come to it. And it's funny. There's a part to me that goes, you didn't really bring it up that cleanly. 
early on. I'm saying as an example. But it doesn't even matter. It that's, doesn't matter. That's, that's the part of exactly. me trying to defend it. Exactly. What I'm saying is, yes, we would have these moments and it would come up for you. It would just come up because yeah. I, I fucked something up and you would, got triggered. Or something would trigger it or we'd watching a show and I'm like, you're an asshole. Like, I can't believe I'm still with you. And instead of you being like, I am an asshole. Thank you for staying with me. Like, I'm so glad we're doing the work. Yeah, that was definitely not the reaction Kissing initially. me, hugging me. It was really hard. And I get that because you want to be defensive. You want to protect yourself and put that armor on. However, that's not going to build trust. Exactly. So if you want to build trust in your relationship, try a different way of showing up to your partner. And part of that, and what we're talking about here is the ending of this is both people allowing both themselves and their partner to do the work at the same time, which gets hard because- it's so much work. <laughs> it's, well, it's so much work and it's overwhelming. And, and you feel shitty. Yeah, it's you're sitting in the gunk. You're sitting in the shit. Like you're quite literally sitting with all your shit around you, your partner's shit all around you, and you're like, "This is gross. It's stinky. It makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't like it." You know what I love about you that know what analogy? You to, what? You still have to go clean the shit. So, like, yeah. imagine literally like there's a flood and your sewer yep. came up. Yep. You can feel crappy about it. And that's okay. You're allowed to feel crappy about it and share that. And self-conscious st- and feel crappy and I feel ugly and I feel smelly and I feel disgusted by this and it's both of our shit and why are we still here? Let's just go run to Mexico. And, and you like, can. Yeah. But that won't fix the house full of shit. Exactly. And so you still have to go Face and do it. the work. You, you just got to sit go do the work. in it. And that's the most uncomfortable part is sitting in it and being like, you're right. Yeah. And so the last little tiny bit about that acceptance piece is if you mess this up, here's the beauty of the trust building. It's never too late to turn back to your partner 30 minutes after you just screamed at her or screamed at him because they were an asshole for bringing up the way you fucked up again six months after it happened and you wish they were just over it and you screamed at them. And 30 minutes later, you're like, fuck, I shouldn't have screamed at them because I'm an asshole. It's still okay to walk back and say, hey, you know what? I lost my shit I shouldn't have 30 minutes ago. And that is the ultimate version of apologizing and taking responsibility and having ownership. And that's all your partner wants. All your partner wants is knowing that you're going to be that kind of person on a regular basis to show up because that's the trust. Exactly. Is that, you know, to this day, I mean, you have my location, but we don't look at it for that anymore because you know that if something even 1% off happened, there's a 99.9% chance, as you said before, that I will come to you and say, hey, this thing happened. I need you to know about it. Yeah. And it feels better anyway, like hearing it from you than being a spy. 100%. Always. Like, I don't want to be a spy. I don't want to be a detective. I want to trust my partner, period. Yeah. So I'm going to live a life in which I trust you, even if I'm putting on that outfit and trying it on before I really feel it. Just like putting on a smile mm-hmm. when you're not really feeling it. Act as if. Yep. And then that will become your new reality. Just like the forgiveness. Act as if you're already in the intention on the way to forgiving. Say the forgiveness prayer or say your own version of I forgive you every single day and you will start to walk that walk. Act act as if is good, but I also want to say this other thing. If you're imperfect in it and you feel bad about being imperfect in it, be okay with that. Just come up to your partner and apologize and do the yeah. do the work as it comes up to you. Don't think you have to somehow magically be 100% trustworthy and they have to be 100% trusting just because you're engaging in it right now. Right, exactly. All right, everybody. So that's our tip for the week. Um, I think the the main thing for you guys listening right now to do to apply this in your life is to just take a deep thought. Think about the interactions you've had with your own partner or somebody in your life that matters to you where you know you screwed it up a little bit. It could have been yesterday. It could have been 15 minutes ago. It could have been a week ago. It doesn't really matter. In the relatively recent past. After listening to this, can you... Do the hard work. Can you come up to that person and say, hey, you know what? I need to own my part of that discussion. Um, I screwed up. I yelled. uh, I wasn't kind or I blamed you for shit that I actually feel bad about. Whatever that is. Now, here's the magic to this. Listen well. There is no but. I only did that because you, none of that can exist in this. Take ownership of your part in it and move forward. And that'll help you build trust. Thank you all so much for paying attention uh, and listening to us. Please, please, if you love this, leave us the reviews, leave us the notes, DM us, tag us, um, screenshot this and tag Sophie and I and Ignite it and tell us what the biggest message was for you. And if you're really brave, tell us what it is that you ended up doing 
to improve trust in your relationships. Love you all. See you next week. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Ignited Podcast. We were so happy to have you along for this ride. Please go and subscribe to this. Leave us a review. We love hearing from you. And if you want more, don't forget to go to ignited.com where all the podcast episodes are available with show notes and so many of the little details and links from each one of these interviews. And you can look at all the future events that we have going on, all the things that make Ignited so special, even beyond this recording. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next week.